Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Jacobin Talks. My name is Micah Utrecht. I'm the deputy editor of Jacobin. As you probably know by now, several times a week, we do these streams, uh, I think three or four times uh, a week, and we do a political education lecture or conversation with an activist, a writer, a uh, thinker, an academic, uh, and we take questions and comments from you if you're watching live. So if you're tuned into the Facebook stream uh, or our stream on YouTube, please chime in in the comments and I will do as best I can to read as many of them as possible. Uh, before we get to today's show, uh, this Wednesday uh, will be another edition of uh, the Jacobin Talks uh, with uh, Jen Pan, who's actually our guest producer today. Thank you to Jen for producing. Uh, and Paul Prescott, who are going to be speaking with Jane McAlevey, who is a fantastic uh, labor organizer and writer and thinker and uh, all around vital voice on labor and the left. So they will be talking to her on Wednesday, 6 p.m. Eastern. So make sure you tune in for that conversation with Jane McAlevey. And today we're lucky uh, to be joined by Mark Rudd. Mark is a former uh, member of the Students for Democratic Society in the 1960s. He was a leader at Columbia University of SDS in 1968 uh, when that uh, when the, the campus occupation took place there in 1968. And I suppose it's sort of fitting that we're talking to you, uh, Mark, on uh, Martin Luther King Day, uh, because uh, obviously King plays a really a central role in in uh, your your life and the activism that you were engaged in in the 1960s, and, and he shows up in your book, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Your book, uh, Underground: My Life with SDS and the Weathermen, uh, because after 1968 uh, in Colombia, you uh, were one of the founding members of uh, Weather and the Weather Underground, uh, which we're going to get into as well uh, and uh, to discuss sort of both the details of that of that time and uh, what the lessons are for radicals today. I think in particular, the new generation of radicals that have really kicked off uh, a, a kind of nascent uh, newborn left in the reborn left, I should say, in, in the United States since the Bernie Sanders campaign. So uh, we are going to hear from uh, Mark for a little bit. Maybe Mark, why don't we start with just some, some basic details about you uh, and your your life, uh, I mean, maybe even before Columbia, just sort of how you know what's your story? How did you how did you come to be Mark Rudd uh, in on Columbia's campus in 1968? And then uh, we'll go through some of the other uh, details of the new left and the weather, uh, and then we'll talk about the about the uh, implications for us today. So why don't you just start with us there, Mark? Uh, your your basic background. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Michael, for uh, having me on the show, and and. Um, let me go back a long time ago. <laughs> um, I turned 18 uh, in 1960, in uh, June of 1965. Uh, I was born in 1947. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a classic boomer, probably the, you know, the, uh, there's an awful lot of people born in 1947. Um, the, the thing about, June of 1965, when I turned 18, was I went down to the draft board and, and registered. That's everybody did that. In fact, my brother was in the army at that time, and uh, my older brother, and uh, my father had been a lieutenant colonel in the uh, uh, U.S. Army Reserves. Um, I didn't think too much about Vietnam. I I I, I was kind of a um, I came from a, a kind of a, a sort of a slightly New Deal, uh, apolitical background. Uh, Democrats, but not violently so. Um, the, uh, the thing was that the United States had invaded uh, Vietnam with main force troops in March and April of 65. And in September, when I got to Columbia, I found that there were already um, an awful lot of people who um, were already uh, studying the war and uh, protesting it and organizing, um, and they were the to me they were the people I fell in with. Uh, that's a long story about um, uh, uh, the 
the years leading up to 68. But basically, we organized on campus. Our, our, our idea was that um, we would build the movement. Uh, see, I, I came, as I said, I came from an apolitical background, but um, a lot of the, the kids I fell in with were red diaper babies. I don't know uh, how common that uh, metaphor is, but uh, now, uh, but it, uh, it, well, we referred to red diaper babies as uh, uh, kids who had grown up in labor, um, socialist or communist families. And there were an awful lot of them at Columbia at that time. Um, they, uh, I think the, the Columbia had opened up to uh, poorer kids and to Jews. Now, we're talking about mostly all white. Uh, be, um, but the, 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 the opening to um, um, uh, black kids uh, was also starting, and that became important in the story later on. Um, but the, um, the kids I fell in with, the white kids, um, were organizing. And we, the idea of organizing came from the red diaper babies, build the base, build the base. And that's what we did. We knocked on doors and um, uh, dormitories and set up teachings and discussions and, and confrontations because um, the idea was that, that uh, uh, you, you could uh, uh, publicize, you could organize through confrontation. Um, there are a number of, 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 of uh, issues, but as this all progressed, um, it, it hit a, a kind of a perfect storm in the spring of 1968. And you mentioned uh, Martin Luther King. Um, on um, April 4th, 1968, uh, Martin Luther King was uh, assassinated. And um, um, Harlem broke into a complete and total uh, riots. Uh, complete and total uh, fires, uh, uh, confrontations with cops. Um, and uh, uh, Columbia is right next to, to Harlem. Um, this was uppermost in, in, in all our minds. Uh, the, the, uh, it, it's kind of like, oh, maybe like what happened uh, in January 6th. Nobody in the country could um, uh, avoid it. You, you, you couldn't avoid thinking about uh, Martin Luther King's murder and the aftermath. Now, a lot of other things had happened too, such as the Tet Offensive in Vietnam um, in um, uh, 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 January to March of, uh, of 68, and then um, uh, LBJ um, abdicating. Um, the peace movement was growing, but it flipped in terms of public opinion uh, during that period of, of the Tet Offensive. Um, it all came to a head. I'm going to skip ahead a lot of, of, of uh, 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 issues uh, uh, that I'm going to leave out. But um, it all came to a head in uh, the um, uh, uh, latter part of April, uh, 68, um, when um, the uh, black students at Columbia uh, seized the building, uh, Hamilton Hall, and uh, the white students seized four more uh, in support of them. Now, the issues had to do, there, there's a picture of Hamilton Hall. Uh, well, wait a minute. No, no, that's, that's Mathematics Hall. That's one of the white buildings, the SDS uh, and Allies building. Um, the, uh, the two issues had to do with, with the university's um, uh, involvement with the war in Vietnam uh, in, uh, through a... a uh, a secret uh, research um, organization called the Institute for Defense Analysis. Uh, SDS had actually uncovered the connection uh, between Columbia and IDA. Uh, and um, we, um, 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 our position was that this violated the objectivity of, uh, of, of the university. It, it represented uh, support for imperialism. Now, just to go back a little, um, we were anti-imperialists by then. Uh, the, uh, again, the red diaper babies and the, the uh, graduate students uh, who were intimately involved with, the, uh, with SDS, they taught the rest of us the nature of the American uh, system, the American uh, presence in the world. Um, and, and we 
uh, became anti-imperialist. This was a period of decolonialization um, and, and a period of national liberation movements. Um, the second issue, so we, we identified the war in Vietnam as an imperialist war. And we, we the first issue was uh, stopping the university's involvement in that imperialist war. The second issue had to do with the um, Colombia's expansion into the Harlem community. Uh, it was going, the, the, uh, the specific issue um, was uh, building a gym in a public park that bordered, um, and Morningside Park uh, bordered on, on Harlem. Um, we allied with, we were allied with, with uh, community uh, people who wanted to stop the, the expansion of Colombia. And the black students in particular um, uh, were um, uh, involved with the community. And when they seized Hamilton Hall, uh, we, uh, 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 they, they did that uh, as a, um, um, as representatives of, of the Harlem community, Harlem at the time being the, the capital of black America. Um, there's a picture of, of um, many black students, yes, and supporters and community people. Um, I, I, part of this, the, the Columbia story was what had to do with militancy and the willingness to act rather than just to talk. And, and, um, but that, that the holding of the buildings also became a national, um, topic because the media was, located in New York City, and somehow or other, I, I was chairman of the of Columbia SDS um, at the time. I was just 20 years old, a, 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 a junior, uh, and um, uh, we, um, uh, I, some, I got uh, uh, recognized as the, the leader of the strike. Unfortunately, it took many, many years uh, to write the uh, balance. There's, there's a picture of me in my skinnier days um, making a speech. Um, the balance being that it was the, the strategic uh, strength of the strike was the black students holding uh, Hamilton Hall and the administration's fear of uh, um, uh, the Harlem community rising. Remember, only less than three weeks before, um, the uh, uh, Harlem had gone up in flames uh, as a response to um, uh, uh, Martin Luther King's murder. So um, the administration of Columbia was scared to uh, call in the cops. And they dithered for about um, uh, a week. Uh, it's a long time, actually. And uh, um, our strength grew over, over this time. Um, Thousands of people came to Columbia, and uh, finally, after about a week, the uh, the cops attacked and beat up uh, hundreds of people and arrested uh, uh, something like close to 700 people. And uh, the uh, as a result, um, the uh, uh, school went out on strike, and that was the biggest uh, anti-war uh, uh, strike uh, and, and anti-racist action up to that time. Um, I'm going to jump ahead now because uh, what happened was that the, the militancy of Columbia uh, kind of drove a, a kind of mania for, for more and more militancy within SDS. Also, um, we, um, we, we, we were pushing constantly um, uh, anti-imperialist politics and also support for black liberation. Um, we saw... Uh, at that time, the, the, the rise of black power. White kids saw the rise of black power, and we took that as, 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 as a, a, a kind of a, a, a challenge to us, how are we going to respond? So support for black power became one of our um, uh, main principles during that era. And so Columbia moved from, from, from what, or rather SDS uh, uh, as a whole, moved from um, what we had defined at that time as resistance to revolution. And so the fantasy of, of revolution took hold in SDS. And um, um, it came to a head in June of 1969 at the uh, National Convention of SDS 
uh, at which there was a major split. Now, the split was not between the reformists and the revolutionaries. The split was between uh, which version of revolution would, would happen. This is kind of like uh, the... Um, well, Mark, look, before you before you go into SDS and in, in, in the convention, can I just have you focus for a second on the uh, occupation? Because I wonder how you look back at it now. I mean, when I was reading your book, I had heard about the Columbia 1968 occupation, but I didn't really understand much about it. I mean, I didn't understand that really, after reading your narrative about it, it seems like one of the really high points of the student movement of the 1960s, that this was a campus occupation that was carried out by uh, student radicals, white students, as well as black students, alongside black people from Harlem uh, who were yes. occupying uh, the, the campus. Um, and it wasn't some kind of, I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about what happened with weather and everything else, but uh, that, it, this was not some kind of uh, ultra left uh, adventurism. I mean, this, this, was, this was a real genuine uh, community backed, you know, mass movement on campus that, that was zeroed in on the two most important issues of the day, which were uh, uh, racism and the Vietnam War, right? Imperialism and white supremacy, uh, all bundled up in one institution. And and um, I'm, I'm so glad you're, you're kind of slowing me down, <laughs> uh, Micah, because yes, um, we uh, saw ourselves as organizers uh, and, and our goal was uh, politicizing the campus. So, so um, within our anti-imperialist politics uh, and our anti-racist politics, um, uh, 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 the fact that we were able to build an actual um, uh, coalition uh, with, with the Student Afro American Society uh, became uh, uh, extraordinarily uh, important. Um, uh, it was our strength. Um, black uh, leaders uh, have both, uh, uh, subsequently uh, uh, of, of the student uh, African American Afro American society have called it the strategic strength of the strike, and that's that's really important. Um, the we we didn't even know what we were doing to the extent that 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 we didn't identify that coalition building as a key element until forty years later. Now, does that is that distinct from other new left organizing that was going on before the campus occupation started? I mean, you did you guys just stumble into this because there were red diaper babies who understood this to be part of their political tradition and how they should go about organizing? Or, or like, why was this? Or I guess was this distinct from what had come before with other kinds of campus organizing across America during that time? Well, remember that that was the the sixties the, uh, um, the was contiguous in time with both the labor movement, the rise of the labor movement, and the civil rights movement. So there were organizers everywhere uh, who had uh, experience. Uh, for example, uh, Berkeley, nineteen sixty four. Um, there were many people who had. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, been in uh, uh, um, Freedom Summer uh, in in '64 and went back to Berkeley and 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 organized there. So, but yes, the the experience of 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 of, of organizing in the South um, and of the labor movement uh, was critical to the rise of SDS. Um, uh, Tom Hayden, one of, the, uh, one of the principal writers of the uh, uh, um, uh, 1962. Port Huron statement uh, had spent uh, quite a bit of time in the South, for example. And so, how would it, how would you characterize sort of like where things ended with the Columbia occupation, and how did that move into the history that you were just starting to go into about where SDS went the next year? I think we we made a fundamental mistake in understanding what had happened. Uh, one I've already pointed to, which was. Um, um, we, we fell into the trap of thinking we were so important, you know, and that Mark Rudd was the leader of the Columbia strike, um, uh, as if, uh, in a way, uh, you know, it's, it's like we accepted the media image of, of white people as, as, as the protagonists, and, and, and we saw ourselves as that important. Um, so that's one big mistake. But uh, a, a big mistake that, that I was directly responsible for was eliminating the history of organizing um, and, and substituting the militancy 
uh, of, of the, um, uh, the last period, the last few months of Columbia SDS, uh, where, where uh, uh, a, a new uh, faction, which I led, uh, called the Action Faction, took over from the Praxis Axis. The Praxis Axis were the old um, red diaper babies who had taught us build the base, build the base. But instead, um, we, we said, no, it's action that's important. What we forgot was that it took years to get people to the point where they would join. It's not, it doesn't happen suddenly. And, and, it, and it happens through building relationships. So our, our years of organizing at Columbia was started way, years before I even got there in 65, uh, culminated in this event of 68. So we, we said, well, it's our militancy. So that became the basis of a faction in uh, SDS, uh, which uh, original, the first name of which became Weatherman. That was, that was the, the origin of the Weather Underground. So just to pause you there, so you, would you say that you came to see yourselves as the sort of like actors in history. You, you, the, the militants who were getting politicized, who were studying Marxism, uh, et cetera, were, you saw yourself like the reason that these things are happening at Columbia, the reason that there are people, you know, in the streets in mass numbers is, is not a result of sort of like structural factors or just, it wasn't a result of mass movement. It was like the, you, the cadre were the ones who were driving the action. I, I think in effect, that's true, but we did have a rationalization or an intellectual, let's say, an intellectual uh, image of of of, uh, of 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 agency of change and, and revolutionary agent. There, there's there's the uh, the revolutionary cadre, but um, uh, the um, uh, um, the agency of change. These are these are are, are, are standard Marxist tropes, and and we um, uh, um, were partisans of the. Um, uh, third world national liberation uh, as as being the um, 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 the revolutionary force and that of course conflicted with the the standard um, um, uh, mechanical Marxist view of the working class um, which was represented by Pro progressive labor party and but, just to ask you real quick so did you buy you know it's often talked about in the 60s you know Marcuse other people making the argument that the, that the American working class was sort of bought off and that you needed a kind of like Che Guevara type strategy you needed people like you to be these sort of extreme militants who were willing to do what needed to be done because the old agent of change the proletariat it was you know uh, they were they were bought off they had boats you know etc they yeah. so they couldn't be relied upon to make a real revolution in this right country. but but um, um, the colonized people in the United States uh, black and brown people uh, 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 internal colonies uh, would would be the revolutionary change here in, and and national liberation around the world Vietnam Cuba uh, China etc um, but you're right in talking about Che Guevara because within this this larger uh, anti-colonial uh, national liberation um, story that we were telling, uh, which which did not involve the working class, um, we idolized uh, Che Guevara, the, the 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 revolutionary hero with the with the machine gun, um, and and in 1967 a, a a theory had appeared. See, we we were intellectuals of of a sort, and we read books. And one of the books we read was Revolution and the Revolution, question uh, mark, by, by Régis Debray. And, and he, he put forward um, in the form of um, interview, er, after extensive discussions with Che and uh, Fidel in Cuba, um, the theory that revolutions were made by small groups of people starting armed struggle, the guerrillas. And uh, that was known as the Foucault theory. So we became adherents of the Foucault theory, which didn't work. Didn't work anywhere in the world. In fact, we were so in love with Che Guevara that we didn't notice that he had been killed in October of 1967 by a combination of the CIA and the Bolivian army and that he had failed. And uh, Foucaultismo never worked anywhere.
And it yeah. certainly would not work in the United States. Now, you went to Cuba at one point, right, in this transition period, I think, between 1968 and when weather started. You write about this in the book? Oh, yeah, before before uh, the Columbia uprising. Of, oh, okay. Of, of well, there's a, there's a scene in, in your book that, that really... I mean, we're going to get into what happened with weather and you you have, obviously you have some critiques of what you did with weather. Um, but there's a scene in there where you go to, to Cuba and you meet some members of, of the Vietnamese Communist Party in Cuba, right? And right, well, uh, we meet Viet Vietnamese um, 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 both from North and South Vietnam. Right. And it, you're, so you're, Mark Rod, I don't forget how old you must, you must be, you can't be older than 20, 21. I, I was 19 at that time. Wow. No, okay. I was twenty, and it was um, February of uh, of 1968, and I was 20 years old. So you, uh, the Cuban Revolution is less than a decade old, right? You, you, you are, you know, not able to legally drink yet. You're in Cuba. You're meeting uh, the Vietnamese who are waging this, you know, war against uh, this this, this imp one of the greatest crimes of all of American history. You know, the the, the Americans. Uh, waging this imperialist war against Vietnam, and I, I, there's a scene in the book where they they give you a ring. Am I remembering this correctly? Yeah, yeah. Well, one ring. of the Vietnamese gave me a, a ring of uh, uh, that was made from a downed American plane, and it had a number on it. It was something like uh, two thousand eight hundred and sixty nine or something like that. Now, this must have just blown your mind as a uh, you know somebody who's as young as you were, and here you are being given a ring made out of the plane that these. The yeah, Vietnamese no, fighters had downed. Uh, Cuba, Cuba was the United States flipped on its head. Um, um, they, they followed the Tet Offensive um, daily as we would follow the World Series. Uh, <laughs> and, and you would go, uh, our, our, our tour bus would get into a small town and people would start uh, um, um, uh, celebrating uh, a new victory in Vietnam. It was... Um, you know, and 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 I, I I fell in love. I fell in love with the idea of socialist revolution. And um, one thing to add is that 1968 was uh, uh, the year of the heroic guerrilla, uh, because they were still um, uh, uh, in, in Cuba was still pushing the focal line in '68. So um, I, I was a product, so to speak, of a moment. Very much so. exactly. That's what I was getting at, and and so y you all went and did some some stuff that probably was not particularly helpful <laughs> to the cause. But but the con I mean, as a as a, such a young person being given like a ring made out of the downed plane of an American fighter, I mean, I like, was proud to wear it. I was proud to wear it. And so, like, I I guess when I was reading that part of your book, I'm like, oh well, this makes everything else makes a lot more sense. Like, this guy is engaging with the, these anti-imperialist fighters, and and he sees himself, and you know, he has this role to play. Him and the other Americans who are there. Yeah, you're right. I'm, uh, exactly. Um, um, we we, uh, uh, <laughs> we had a very funny slogan. Uh, we would be um, uh, 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 revolutionaries in the belly of the beast. But what's yeah. funny is that the, the the Vietnamese tell you at some point, I can't remember if it's when you were in Cuba, but they say to you, what would be best for us would be for you to go back to the United States and build a broad anti-war movement. And yeah. you kind of couldn't hear that because- No, we, no we didn't want to build a broad anti-war movement. Right. We want to get to the root of the problem. Radicals always go to the root. And the root is imperialism and cap and capitalism. So we wanted to jump many, many steps. Instead of building the base, we just wanted to go forward. Um, there, um, I, I picked up a, a, a slogan in Cuba. Um, it was a quote from uh, Jose Marti, uh, the poet uh, who was the kind of uh, uh, the soul of the Cuban Revolution. Uh, he died way before 1959. Um, now is the time of the furnaces. And only light should be seen. Now, uh, we, uh, maybe it's obvious to some of our listeners, but can you just expel out what was wrong with this approach that you all were taking? It didn't work. <laughs> okay, that's the most important part. Yeah, it it it, 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 it was a fantasy. It was a delusion. Um, it, it it was no different in a certain way from the delusion of the people uh, on January sixth. They thought they were going to start a revolution, and that everybody's going to join them and they were going to put Trump back in the White House. It's just, it's delusionary. That's, that, it, that's just the way it is. And it sounds to me like you all thought that 
to be, well, obviously to be a radical is a good thing because you're going to the root. And so to, if, if you're a radical, then you should be a militant. And if, if a little radicalism is good and that means a little bit of militancy, well, a lot of radicalism, a lot of militancy must mean then you are doing your job as a radical even better because you're just doing more of it. So you're being well, more radical, you're being more militant. Thank you, very well put. Um, I, I, would, I would add uh, that uh, the um, uh, um, black power movement, uh, the, the civil rights movement, the black freedom struggle had morphed from the nonviolent um, integrationist civil rights movement uh, to black power uh, by 1968. I, I came of age, so to speak, uh, during that transition. And uh, uh, um, uh, one of the slogans of black power, which was orig had originated with Malcolm X was, by any means necessary. Well, what does by any means necessary mean? It's a code word 50 years ago for violence. We have to pick up the gun. It, 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 um, the the, the uh, historian V.J. Prashat talks about the cult of the gun during that era, and and we got the cult of the gun, you know, uh, and 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 uh, uh, it, it was a terrible mistake. So that brings us very nicely into 1969. What happened with SDS and the beginning of weather? Well. What happened in 69, uh, my book um, uh, is, is divided into three parts. The first part about Columbia, and, and um, I call that, in my mind, I refer to that as good organizing, the, the Columbia story. There are some problems which I'll, we could talk about, such as uh, um, violent rhetoric, like, you know, up against the wall motherfucker, that kind of thing. But it was basically good organizing, and it worked. And we followed the traditional organizing model that had been developed through the labor movement and the civil rights movement. But then we moved to militancy. We misidentified the source of our power, which was organizing and coalition at Columbia. And we moved to militancy and we made militancy the issue. And that was that's the second part of the book, which um, is about the rise and fall of SDS, um, we substituted bad organizing for good organizing. But then that didn't work either. Um, for example, we, um, we called for a, um, um, a national uh, action to bring the war home in October of 1969 in Chicago. And we envisioned thousands of revolutionary youth meeting in Chicago to protest the opening of the Chicago conspiracy trial, uh, also known as the Chicago eight. Well, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. We didn't, the revolutionary youth did not appear because there were maybe 200 of us. Incidentally, we started with 500 people in the weatherman faction. And in the course of our organizing, we went down to 200. And that should have told us something right there. Yeah, that's a but warning sign. I've ever heard of our ideas. And we knew we were right. And we knew Che Guevara was right. And we knew it was the era of national liberation. And we knew we had the revolution has come, time to pick up the gun. And we knew we had to support the Panthers. And we knew we had to do this and we had to do that. That the next thing to do was to destroy SDS, close all the national, close the national and regional offices close down the chapters, and start a revolutionary guerrilla army. Right. That, the thinking, such as it is, behind the weather underground. Now, just to reiterate what you just said, you were talking about taking this organization, Students for Democratic Society, which for all its problems was a really central uh, force in the 1960s, giving well we only had a hundred thousand active members on 400 campuses all right Chump, and we decided and a small cabal of people of whom i was involved i was one of them decided that it wasn't revolutionary enough that the time had come for revolution now is the time of the furnaces and only light should be seen right the, so, of the revolutionary is to make the revolution not talk about it but make the revolution so what yes what i'm getting at is you took a real a mass organization that was playing this key role in all of these fights that were in the air of in that era and you essentially uh 
decided to, as you said, destroy it out of the belief that what you needed was like a uh, better few, but better in, in Lenin's words, right? I mean, you needed sort of like hardened cadres who would be the ones who would be leading this kind of uh, uh, what street fighting and getting the the revolutionary youth of America to rise up and along with, you know, al working alongside the Black Panthers and other black radicals. Um, and and it, it didn't it didn't seem to work out too well. <laughs> well, let me just add one one thing. Um, that was also the period when the, when the Black Panthers and other black uh, revolutionaries were, were under tremendous attack. And it appeared to us, for example, um, at the end of 1969, uh, when Fred Hampton was murdered, um, it was war. And so we said, well, we're white people. What can we do? We can take some of the, some of the casualties. We can take some of the burden of this war off of black people. And it's racist not to do that. You know, it's very easy to define what's racist and what's not racist if you have that mindset. So what was racist was, was to keep SBS as a on-campus student safe reform protest movement and not to engage in the war which was going on. So that was pushing us in that, in that direction also. Um, uh, th that context is, is, a, is pretty important. I, I would say that, that um, the impact on black power of my uh, on my life of black power has been enormous and i've had to think through that um, um for the last 50 years uh, to find out what was what, what was real in black power and what was not so we're <laughs> as, as i predicted might happen because your book is so rich and there's so much to talk about we're, we're rapidly uh, running out of time uh, we'll probably go a little bit over an hour but um just talk a little bit before i ask you some general questions talk a little bit more about sort of uh, weather, your time and weather, what you did, and uh, the end of all that. Well, I be, uh, the first thing that, that the weather, one of the first things that the Weather Underground did was on March 6, 1970, um, we killed three of our own people in an accidental bomb blast. And from that moment on, I was a fugitive. That's uh, West 11th Street. It's a townhouse owned by one of our, the father of one of our members. And they were making bombs in the, in the basement. I was not there, but I knew what was being planned. What was being planned was to, to attack uh, a, uh, a non-commissioned officer's dance at um, Fort Dix, uh, the site of uh, basic training uh, for the U.S. Army. So the theory was that nobody was innocent by now. We had moved to the, to the, to the point of what I would call a, a kind of a common definition of terrorism, which is attacking innocent people. And, and um, uh, fortunately, the bombs did not get to Fort Dix. We, they, 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 they exploded prematurely and three of our own people died. But as a consequence of that, um, I became a fugitive as did a number of, uh, a lot of other people. Um, then there were indictments for earlier actions, um, federal indictments. And so um, approximately, I don't know, 35, 50 people, uh, or maybe more, were, were, were wanted by the feds from that moment. So we had to build an underground organization, and that became the Weather Underground, WUO. And um, however, okay, go ahead. Th th here's the however. That happened on March 6, 1970. On May 4, 1970, um, the National Guard at Kent State killed four students. And before that, um, the um, um, uh, Mississippi uh, State Police and the Jackson uh, Police had killed, um, I, I forget, was it three two or three students at Jackson State? And, um, and, and so... As a result of Kent State and Jackson State, thousands of college campuses, millions of people went on strike. And that was by far the largest uh, student strike in the history of the United States. Now, did, did you take that strike as somehow confirmation of what you guys were doing that it, it was working? Well, yeah, yeah. How, how did you we, and we saw ourselves as taking that and leading and leading 
and and that would be like the be the beginning of a of a revolutionary movement and a revolutionary army. But at the same time, I also recognize that that my personal strengths and all of our personal strengths were in organizing, not in building bombs. Well, I would say you duck your skill is definitely not in building bombs. I mean, it's not funny. I shouldn't laugh, but you know, you you guys blew yourselves up. I mean, you, three people were killed uh, yeah. in building bombs, and you guys. And this, what's so tragic about it, of course, is that just two years earlier, you had been this leader in this real, as we already said, this genuine mass struggle that was actually bringing together both black people in Harlem and wh white and black student radicals on, on Columbia's campus. I mean, you had sort of showed the way, and then yet two years later, here's this bomb exploding in a townhouse. I was an organizer and I became something I, I, not organizer. And in fact, in the interim period, the, the, the struggle with an SDS, I had a crazy line, which I'd repeat, that organizing is another word for going slow. And given the extent of the moral horrors that were taking place. And the, oh. and, and, and the delusion um, um, that um, 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 masses of young people would become revolutionary. I want to add one thing here. There's a certain um, narcissism or solipsism at the core of this. It, 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 it says, well, my model, what I do and show to the world, that will become the model for everybody else. It doesn't work like that. That's not organizing. You know, you can call a lot of things, but left-wing adventurism, vanguardism, you call a lot of things, but it's not organizing, you know? And I, I want to jump ahead 50 years ago, uh, uh, 50 years ahead, uh, on, on January 5th, Georgia, that was organizing. And so um, talk a little bit, I guess, we're, we, we're going to have to run through this history very quickly, but I mean... After the townhouse, what do you do? What is your life like for those years? You're underground. You're, what, setting off a number of bombs in different places around the country that never kill anyone. They cause property damage. Uh, but this is this was one of the main things that the Weather Underground is up to at this time, right? Well, a, a few months after the townhouse, um, in, by June of 68, uh, of 70, uh, there was a rectification that took place within the organization. And uh, people recognized what, what they called at the time the military error, uh, which I, I think I'd now I would call it terrorism. And, 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 and a decision was made, or a good decision, to not attack human beings and to make sure that nobody would be hurt. And somehow or other, it worked. It worked. We, we did not kill anybody, but we still kept the, the the bombing going. You mean and, it worked in the sense that the, the bombs went off, but it it didn't. Nobody was nobody else was killed. After yeah, the, right. Townhouse. With our bombs, but other people were killed with other bombs, and so we didn't differentiate very clearly. Um, I called it. Uh, subsequently, I referred to it as we substituted bombing light from for bombing heavy. But it, we 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 never gave up the armed struggle principle. The principle that the revolution would happen, uh, um, uh, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Mao Zedong. Um, anyway, I, at, I, I was demoted in the organization, although I was a founder of it, it. It was a very hierarchical organization. There was always leadership and leadership within leadership and layers of leadership. It follows the Leninist military uh, idea of hierarchies. Um, I was demoted back to a cadre, so to speak, uh, and I lost my leadership position. That was fine with me because I, I just I didn't have it. You know, I couldn't continue to pretend that I was something I wasn't. By the end of 1970, I was out. I, I left the organization, um, although although I was still a fugitive, federal uh, fugitive charges. Um, so I stayed in, 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 in contact with the organization, pretty close contact, but I did not participate in the life of the organization, voting and projects and bombings and stuff like that after 19, um, the end of 1970. So I went out on my own with, with my partner uh, at the time, and we worked. We worked jobs. We lived in working class 
communities and we worked jobs around the country. And, and um, it didn't take me long to realize it was a total waste of time. The only thing we, we were accomplishing was not getting caught, which is pretty good as long as the war is going on, 1965, uh, 75, the war was over. So um, I had to make a decision and, and, and I decided to, to turn myself in or in 75, April 75. But it took two more years, two and a half years to do that because I didn't want to uh, jeopardize anybody's safety, anybody who, who had helped me. And so what was the outcome of your turning yourself in? Did you have to face charges and go to jail or anything like that? You'd think. Nah, nothing. Nothing. Well, nothing. The story of, of the end of weather, right, is that you all turn yourselves in, but through COINTELPRO and through all of the kinds of repression that the FBI and the rest of the government was engaged in, here we are. You're on this list somewhere, the FBI's most wanted list, I assume? No, no, that wasn't the most wanted. That was just a bunch of uh, weather people. I, I think I'm, I don't know if I'm there or not. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> well, but the you have stories in the book about... The most wanted was burnt. What's that? You have stories in the book about walking into, I think, stores and seeing yourself on a most wanted list, right? Or, well, yeah, the post office, office. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd occasionally walk into a post office and and and, uh, and not most wanted, but they'd have lists of fugitives. They'd have little flyers, and I'd leave through the flyers. I'd find my flyer and take tear it down. Um, but um, this is, by the way, very indicative of, of Mark of how of how you carry yourself. You're like, yeah, I was on the list. I wasn't the most wanted, but you know, I was I was on the list. This is the kind of humility that comes through in your book. <laughs> There's only one person on the most wanted list from us. It was Bernadine Dorn. She's the most wanted. Um, you know, I, I, I'm just a, I'm, I'm just a, a, a suburban Jewish kid from uh, 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 Maplewood, New Jersey. I'm not a rebel. I'm not. I'm not a great revolutionary. Believe me. I now, am what I am. So uh, there, there, there's if people want the full details, they really should read your book. I can't recommend it enough uh it's it's just a riveting read underground my life with scs and the weathermen um by, by the way I, I i've told you this mark but very unfairly i got your copy of your book 11 years ago and i i i was like i'm gonna learn about weather and then i i read and watched some other stuff uh about weather and i was so put off by what i perceived to be the arrogance of people who are involved with weather that I was like, I'm not gonna touch this thing. I carted your book around for 11 years, but uh, I never read it for 11 years. And when I finally did like two months ago, I was very happy. I'm glad you didn't give it away. <laughs> Me too. Uh, so this, I mean, all of this is a, a really vital history in its own right. But for those of us in particular who are trying to build a 21st century left, especially through the Democratic Socialists of America, um, you know, we're pe people who are in DSA and who are who are these these new new leftists uh, want to know, you know, what what they should be taking from your history. Sort of what are the mistakes that were made by you and people like you that they should be uh, on on the lookout for? Well, well uh, the good and the bad. I mean, you know, you, you all did some really before you went to weather. You, as I've hopefully emphasized, you've done you did incredible organizing at Columbia and every, everything else before that. Um, so it's not it's not a full tale of the folly of, of youthful radicals. I mean, it, 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 there's some true heroism in there. But then, of course, by the end, it really goes off the rails. So what, what, what would you say to people who are of this new generation of millennial and Zoomer socialists and Marxists uh, who want, want to be serious about organizing? They, they really do want to change the world. They want to stop U.S. imperialism. They want to win Medicare for all and, you know, decent affordable housing. They want to put some tangible wins on the board. What, what is the lesson from your life history in, in the new left and after about how to go about doing that and how not to go about doing that? Well, I think that Jacobin is, is doing a great job of, of uh, studying the history of, of successful uh, social and political movements and trying to figure out what can be learned about how did they work? How were they organized? Right? And um, 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 my own um, 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 study has led me to the civil rights movement, uh, the classical civil rights movement, not so much black power, but, 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 but um, uh, SNCC, for example, SNCC in, 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 in Mississippi, uh, 1961 to 1965. How did they do that? Right? And, I, and, and, and or the women's movement. 
right? Or the gay movement. Generally speaking, it has to do with strategic organizing. And, and that is, it tends to follow a certain pa traditional pattern. The civil, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, you're going to have, um, uh, um, 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 uh, McAlevey, uh, Susan McAlevey, uh, on, Jane on, McAlevey. Yeah. Yeah. She's a traditional labor organizer. Um, so find out how successful movements are organized. Then the second thing, uh, is, um, I think the new left in general, not just us, but in general, went off the rails by not seeking power. And that the issue of power is critical. How do we move from uh, issue-oriented mass momentum-driven movements to, to structured power movements? And, and that is what we're facing. Well, we're facing both now. We have to build momentum-driven movements, but we have to figure out how to build a structured movement for power. And one of the obstacles is we don't want power. We're not the kind of people who like to tell other people what to do. It's a problem. It's a real problem. We love democracy. We love, we, we, we don't think that, uh, that, that we have all the answers, right? But how somebody has to gain power, that's a problem. Well, this is something from the beginning of Jacobin, this has been central to our project, is talking about how the American left has been very dominated by uh, anarchism and anarchistish uh, theories of how social change happens, and you know, I'm somebody who was politicized. I was radicalized as an anarchist, but uh, it, it's clear that 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 is a that is a uh, that that unwillingness to really reckon with and, and and attempt to wield power in broad sense, both in terms of vying for uh, you know uh, uh, elect in, in elections, you're running leftists for office, getting people to legislate as leftists, um, but also to do the kind of mass ba based like organizing, you know, like serious organizing uh, that you're talking about. I mean, that has to be central to what we are about. And that's, that's as I said, that's the whole tragedy of, of your life from the late 60s into the 70s is that you're sort of, you were, you were doing the, 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 the real mass organizing and then because of, for good reasons, because you were appalled at this absolute, you know, genocidal level atrocity that was being carried out by the U.S. government, uh, you, you all kind of went off the rails. I mean, but you, in, if, if we're serious about stopping the U.S. imperial juggernaut, stopping the, you know, mass deaths of the Vietnamese or, you know, Yemenis today or any of the people around the world who the U.S. is uh, directly or indirectly responsible for killing, we have to be serious about organizing that in, in a way that actually can change the world and can actually stop those things, not just stuff that makes us sort of feel good uh, about uh, oh yeah, it, we, well, the, the, these people over here are fighting, so we're going to show that we're serious by setting off bombs or doing some kind of like you know uh, uh, visually you know militant action, something where we where we're like yeah, look at us, we are militants, we're in the street being militant. Right. I, I I I ride the hobby horse of self-expression versus strategy for power. Right. And and we were we were expressing ourselves. We, I think it drove us nuts to realize that, that our country was murdering millions of people. Three, as it turned out, it was about three to five million people. Um, a, a friend of mine uh, within the Weathermen said to me, Mark, you've got to forgive yourself a little because you've got to forgive us because it's not easy to know exactly what to do when you realize your, your, your country is murdering millions of people. But we have to. We have to figure out how to gain power. And that's why I'm, I'm so hopeful now uh, because of the example that the black women in, in Georgia have given us. Uh, folks who are watching, we're going to run a little bit over an hour. Uh, chime in questions. I'm going to do my best to read as many of them as possible, which is probably not very many of them. I'm going to try. Um, Mark, uh, before I, I take other people's questions, uh, just some, some things in passing. The th one thing I love about your book, which is unrelated to anything we've been talking about so far, or uh, unrelated to strategy or anything else is that there's such a, uh, you know, so many people in the 60s are talked about as like the, the 60s radicals. I mean, they were anti-war, they were against Jim Crow, white supremacy, et cetera, et cetera. But you know what it was really about was they, they hated mom and dad and they wanted to rebel against mom and dad. And you read your book 
And Mark Rudd does not hate mom and dad. Ma Mark Rudd loves mom and dad. Mom is like bringing you like cookies while you're underground when you guys are meeting up. Like you, you have some disagreements with your parents. You don't want to be your your father, but like they're, they're that that sort of sense of love is there the whole time. And even though you've driven them insane because you're participating in these bombings across America, like they still very clearly love you. And it's just very obvious that uh, the reason that you were doing what you were doing was not about working out your mommy and daddy issues. It was about a real revulsion at, at the at the horrors of American imperialism. Yeah, I mean, um, there, there, there's so many myths about the 60s and, and you know, the revolt against the parents is one of them. Um, but, uh, my, you know, I, I come from, a, from an immigrant family and immigrants, they stick together, you know? My, the FBI came to my grandmother's and uh, uh, looking for me, and they said, "Go to hell! Go to hell! Get out there!" <laughs> grandma did not stand. You know, they, my grandma wasn't going to take any shit from the FBI. Grandma doesn't talk to the feds. <laughs> Well, that's that's um, yes, that that comes across very strongly. And then one question that I uh, have from uh, Benjamin Balthazar, who is uh, Jackman contributor and who studies uh, the left and uh, Jews in the new left in particular, Jews in the new left and the old left, is about the your own Judaism and how that impacted uh, your your activism. And what role did that play in the kind of organizing that you did or how, how it is that you came to uh, be Mark Rudd, the activist and organizer? Um, I, you know, I, I don't think I wrote about that very much in the book. I might have. Um, well, definitely there was there was the, the consciousness of... of of racism and 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 um, uh, um, uh, anti-Semitism that came through thinking about the Holocaust, growing up in the in the in the in the shadow of the Holocaust, and so I knew that that racism uh, and military aggression were 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 united, and so um, the first chapter in my book I called uh, "Good German." I didn't want to be a good German, you know. I didn't want to want to pretend that my country was not doing these things. So that's one thing. Let me, before you move on, let me just interject there because that's that part of your book was fascinating to me because w there is a, a often a, a kind of refrain that we hear sometimes from the, the sort of the right wing Zionist American Zionists uh, is that it's sort of like a defense of the unique moral horror of the Holocaust uh, and, and, a, and a sort of refusal to take that event and sort of take lessons from it and say, well, what happened you know the, the kind of moral horror that we saw in the in the Holocaust. We're seeing some shades of that in Vietnam. I mean, you just said you know three million people, three million Vietnamese were were murdered and, and yeah. killed uh, in Vietnam. I mean, that's you know half the number of Jews who were killed during the Holocaust. So you 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 used that experience of uh, of the the Jewish memory of the Holocaust to look at what. Uh, the American imperial state was doing and say like, you know, that, that that's what uh, like a never again kind of thing means, right? Well, never again is the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the rallying cry of the far right, the Zionist far right, never again, uh, unfortunately. And, and so um, there's a conflation of, of, uh, of uh, in other words, uh, the, the, the Holocaust justifies colonialism in Israel, in, in Palestine. And that's a big problem. Uh, from that, I, 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 uh, it, it informed my anti-nationalism. I never could fall for Jewish nationalism, let's say. Um, but um, growing up Jewish in the United States, um, consciousness of the Holocaust, there's a lot of that. But I, I do reject the idea of my Judaism, which was a suburban uh, conservative, uh, which is middle of the road, uh, Judaism, um, was not that liberal and socially conscious. Basically, we were the pro we were um, the people who were fleeing uh, the black cities to the suburbs. My family um, was involved in white flight from Newark uh, to to the, to Maplewood, New Jersey. So there was a lot of of racism uh, tinged in there. And and um, but what I did get from being a, a, a Jew was more the idea of being an outsider. And being an outsider, you can be more critical. 
And so that's what I get. I don't, I, I'm not a person who believes that Jewish theology is any particularly more liberal or more welcoming or anti-racist or anything else. And to me, the proof of that is Israel. So uh, uh, um, I'm not big for Jewish theology as being uh, 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 more humane or more moral. But um, uh, um, you're, thank you for, for recognizing the, uh, um, the Holocaust. But uh, my lesson of the Holocaust is be an anti-fascist. Uh, question from our commenters. How do we get casual Bernie voters to think more seriously about imperialism without confusing or alienating them? This is a question, obviously, because the, the, the sources of radicalization in 2021 are mm. less the kind of you know, horrors that we, that we saw in the Vietnam War and more uh, you know, miserable domestic conditions at home, you know, right. student loans and uh, incredibly expensive housing and all of the rest of it. And so how, how, you know, it seemed like it was easier in your period to have the, the imperialism conversation front and center. How do we do that uh, today in a very different political context? I wish I had the answer, you know, because um, um, uh, both of Bernie's campaigns did not talk about imperialism and did not talk about the cost of imperialism. We can't afford Medicare for all or, or um, uh, single payer or uh, universal health care and everything else that we need when we're squandering everything on the military. And that, but that's a big deal. And, and the, 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 neither of the Bernie campaigns, 16 or 20, chose to take that up for obvious reasons. And um, we're, you know, I, I had a, a, a very beloved history professor at the University of New Mexico who told us that every single empire ends up as a military patronage state. And that's what we have. We are a military patronage state. The, um, um, the, the, um, um, the economy of my state, New Mexico, would not exist without uh, uh, military production and research. Um, I don't know how we're going to take this up uh, other than um, um, the way in which uh, spending for the military impoverishes us. You know, um, I'm, I, 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 the, I, I follow uh, um, uh, Jonathan Shell, who wrote that the big problem of the 21st century will be uh, how to create international law as an alternative to the war system. We have now ensconced, institutionalized the war system, right? That's my daughter calling. <laughs> we have the war watching. System. She should be watching you right now. What's that? She should be watching you right now. She should show, she should know that you're on prime time right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she does. Uh, she's too busy, I'm sorry. She's a teacher and has two kids. The teachers are suffering horribly. People don't realize how, how bad the teacher, the teachers are going nuts. Anyway, I was a teacher for 30 years. Um, no, the, 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 the job of the 21st century is to, is to replace the war system with international law. It's a hell of a lot cheaper, but I don't know how to do it. You know, I can't convince people that this whole defense thing is a fraud. I suspect that, um, I, I just don't know. I don't have the answer to that. Do you have an idea, uh, Micah? Well, uh, I, I do not. Uh, but, you know, what's to me a very interesting part of Bernie's career, is if you read his first book, Outsider in the House, which was later yeah. published as Outsider in the White House, and when he was the mayor of Burlington, he established these sister city programs with uh, cities and towns in El Salvador, in Nicaragua, and he would do these teachings. I mean, there's times when he brought Noam Chomsky to Burlington to talk about uh, the U.S. intervention in Central America. And he used his office in City Hall as mayor of Burlington, this fairly small town, and, and, and figured out ways to say, here's what's going on in El Salvador, and here is how awful it is, and here's how much we're spending on it. And he made sort of direct connections that, that in addition to the moral horror of what is happening to Salvadorans, this is also why you have potholes on your street that we in City Hall can't fill because all of the vast riches of this country are going to 
killing peasants and trade union leaders in El Salvador rather than providing you with the things that you need at home. And so uh, in, earlier on in his career, he uh, had a really, certainly for like local left elected officials today, it's a model that could be brought back yeah. uh, and, and found it very uh, compelling. But but of course, nobody has, nobody has all of the answers to this question. Yeah. This is like one of the hardest questions for us to answer uh, right now. We have one question from the chat because we've been talking a lot about uh, sectarianism uh, and all of the sectarian behavior and thinking that happened after 1968. So um, how do we combat that? How do we sort of not get, how do leftists not get too high on their own supply and uh, fall into these sectarian traps? How do we keep our eyes on the ball of, of mass politics, of, of real movement building, um, and, and not sort of go off in these sectarian directions? The goal is power. The only way anybody can gain power is through coalition. We've got to be able to, to work with people who disagree with us. It's just got to be. Or, or people who have other ideas. And, and that's one aspect of it. Another is don't get, we can't be too in love with our own ideas as intellectuals. You know, Jacobin is, is first and foremost a, a, a magazine of intellectuals. So you have the problem of intellectuals, which is they believe, we believe our own ideas. We think they're real. You know, and the only proof we generally have of it is that we have those ideas. It's classic idealism. So the problem then is to realize we don't have the answers. We just don't. And nobody does. No party does. No, no, no one faction. Nobody's got, got all the answers. So we fought. We literally physically fought each other over, um, 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 in SDS over the following question. Who's going to make the, the, the revolution? Non-white people? or the working class. 50 years later, no revolution. Uh, well, another question from the chat about how we should think about the media's coverage of protest movements, both now and in the past. I mean, you mentioned in your talk that the media turned you into this celebrity. And I mean, you're, you were what, on the cover of all these magazines, uh, you know, photos from the front lines of Columbia, you became this kind of a, a superstar. Uh, I mean, do you have any reflections on that role of the media in, in seizing hold of people like you at the expense of other rank and file student radicals or other radicals? Or at the end of the book, you talk about how uh, the black students on campus, uh, right. I mean, they, they didn't get their, their due in any way. And it was decades later that you were only able to work all of that out together. So what role did the media play in all of that? Well, it, it, <laughs> The way you've described it, it's, it's quite pernicious, um, and, and you've got to be really careful. I think Black Lives Matter has worked very hard to try to figure out um, uh, how, 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 to, how, how to surf these shoals, you know, um, especially on identifying individuals as leaders. Um, but, then that, but you need individuals to articulate. It's got to happen. It's inevitable. Um, one of the observations, there's a wonderful book that came out in the early 70s by Todd Gitlin, the sociologist, and one of the original founders of SDS, in which it's called The Whole World is Watching. And one of the things he, 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 he does in it is he shows that over time, um, the, the experience at Columbia and Weatherman um, was a good example of substituting the media as our base for our original base. Our original base was students at Columbia University. That's the base. Those are the people we're trying to move. They're the people we're trying to mobilize and politicize and mobilize. That's the base. But over time, the media became the base. And the problem with the media is they're not a real base. They don't the, – the, the, uh, sensationalism, the, the more violent. You can't have another um, uh, uh, protest uh, – uh, dem uh, dem picket line, you've got to move to more confrontation because that gets more uh, 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 space in the media. It's it's a terrible problem. And, and I, I've seen, over the years, I've seen numerous organizations rise and get too much coverage too early. It's just, it's, all, it, it's automatic. Well, and arguably the problem could be worse today because it is actually a lot easier to dominate media cycles. I mean, you, you don't need to stage some kind of days of rage style uh, spectacle in, in Chicago, on the streets of Chicago. I mean, you can just get a hashtag trending and feel like you're 
yeah, uh, you know, dominating the media. Put bullhorns on your head and <laughs> get a tattoo, and you, you got it made. Yeah. Um, no, it, it, you know, we have a bigger problem than the media. It's the social media, than the mass media, and 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 how to how how to reinject truth, facts, and 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 analyses uh, uh, instead of conspiracies and and lies. I, I don't I don't know how to address that. That that's a terrible problem. Well, at, at at the end of our conversation here, your your uh, your the humility that I mentioned is coming through as you're as you're admitting that you don't have all the answers to the problem. So, which I, I have to say, it, it's it's the thread that goes through your whole book. And you know, you go from Mark Rudd cover of you know major national magazines uh, in 1968 to Weather Underground and staging these spectacles. And then after it's over, after you turn yourself in. Uh, and, and you sort of have a real think about what it is that you had just spent the last, what, decade or so of your life doing, um, you become a kind of a foot soldier in, in the fight for a better world. Like, not somebody who is on, on the covers of magazines anymore, standing in front of all the cameras, but, you know, you write in the book, for example, about uh, teaching at a New Mexico community college and, you know, organizing a local of the American Federation of Teachers, I believe. Uh, so you you become a sort of uh, you know foot soldier in this uh, fight for uh, a better world through the old tools through you know uh, through organizing unions and then later you talk about being involved in the anti Iraq War movement and, and and Central American Solidarity too I think in the eighties so uh, it's kind of a, a, a rare trajectory where you sort of go from you know Mark Rudd the the this this you know national figurehead guy who's the face of this these upsurges of the sixties. To who wanted Mark to Rudd. live and die? Who wanted to live and die like Che Guevara? I wanted right. to be Che Guevara. Right to to, to Mark Rudd, the uh, you know the rank and file member of his organizing yeah. committee at his community. Well, the, the mild mannered math teacher. Um, I, I I was lucky on two grounds. One was the period I was underground was actually a very good period for me, in that I had to become nobody. It's good to be nobody, and it's good to work and at menial jobs. And to, and to get to know people at that level, not to be an upper middle class intellectual. That's one thing. And then the second is that I chose to teach at a community college. And at community college, that's all you got is working class people, basically. And 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 your your fellow teachers are you you know, I became nobody knew me in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the way they knew me in New York. So I was just a teacher. That's all I was. And that was, that saved my life. You know, that saved my life. I became uh, back it, when I, when I finally had to, had to become Mark Rudd again, which was after the weather underground film came out in 2003 and after the uh, attack on Iraq, um, I knew who I was and I didn't have any problems uh, of, of becoming a media uh, figure or a spokesperson again. It's difficult. But uh, it worked out pretty well. Now, would your counsel to the young radicals watching this today, uh, I mean, of course, you, you recognize the necessity for leadership and for, you know, the value of media projects like Jacobin and, and those kind of things. But, I mean, is the overall takeaway to sort of like go and do likewise? I mean, go, you know, be, be that kind of foot soldier in the fight for uh, a better world in the same way that uh, you've done uh, after I, I you know, left. left. I mean, I, I think that I think the thing is be an organizer. That's all. Just be an organizer. You know, I I, I don't like the word activist, incidentally, because that implies that 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 that, that the that implies self-expression more than anything. Uh, I'm, just be an organizer. Figure out how to build a movement. That's all. Get together with other people and just be an organizer. And the best organizers I've 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 known or heard about. Or, or the ones who generally are behind the scenes, you know. Um, uh, my model is Miss Ella Jo Baker uh, of, 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 of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, she was the guru behind SNCC. People didn't see her out. Um, occasionally she'd make speeches, but she worked with people, built relationships, and, 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 and taught. And, and um, we need more organizers, you know. We need, I mean, Jacobin... Um, is wonderful in that it sees itself. I think you guys see each other, uh, see see yourselves as as doing a magazine for organizers. Is, am, am I right? 
definitely a, a big part of what we one of the yeah. things that we do. For yeah, sure. and I, I would love to see schools for organizers like um, um, the um, um, Highlander uh, Folk School or the Highlander Center now. I mean, that was at the core of the civil rights movement. We don't have anything like that now. You know, a school for organizers, something to consider. Well, uh, on Wednesday's show, Jane McAlee will be on, and she uh, recently organized a, a strike school, an international strike school. So I'm sure uh, for, for trade union activists uh, around the world. So uh, we'll be, you'll be hearing more of that if you tune in on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, to the Jacobin Show uh, with Jen Pan and Paul Prescott with a special guest, uh, Jane McAlevey and uh, Mark Rudd. Thank you very much for your time. Again, the book is called Underground. Uh, I cannot uh, recommend it enough. Do not be like me and wait 11 years, you know, and tr bring this book across multiple state lines and half a dozen apartments. Just read it now. That's that's my suggestion to you. And uh, thank you, Mark, so much uh, for, for taking the time to, uh, to talk with us today. It's a pleasure to get to know you, Micah. And thanks all for watching. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Share it on your social media feeds, and we will see you all again soon. Thank mm -hmm. you.